From the moment you boot up Bioshock, you can feel the story grab hold of you. A plane crashes at sea, a mysterious lighthouse, a sprawling city beneath the ocean. Hooking the player from the first touch without overwhelming him with convoluted RPG mechanics was key to the success of the game and the skillful ramping up of Bioshock's legendary gameplay. Bioshock has an amazing opening sequence that I can't imagine the game without it, with uh, you know, the plane and sort of the crash. But I understand that didn't come online until like the very end of development, Sean, is that true? We had a couple of really depressing play tests. We had built all these systems, we thought we were doing a good job of like giving basically people a playground to play with and, and things to do. And when we had a play test, we, man, we didn't realize how bad of a job we were doing in exposing those systems to the player because we were so in, you know, in these systems and in our own heads, we had no idea that we just weren't facing them towards the player at all. So a after that play test, you know, we, we took a long, cold look at what we were doing and realized that we had to introduce it. We were confident enough in the systems that they were going to be fun and meaningful to the player, but we really had to think about how we we're going to introduce these systems to the player and in such a way that they understand why the systems were there. Like, you can't ship a readme file with the game and expect people to read it. Like, it has to be part of the experience. So the challenge is, how do you introduce people to these systems, but do it in such a way that it fits within the narrative? So we had to integrate all of these things into the story cleanly so that the player felt like it was one, you know, one smooth experience. And I think the zap them and whack em thing was one, one of those. Two, and the one-two punch. Yeah, the yeah. one-two punch that came out of that. The plane sequence at the beginning, I, I heard a story that like a programmer put that together in like a day or two, and it was uh, it was a very last minute thing, right? It was, so we had done a focus test, and um, we had had, it was one of the most depressing experiences in my life, because we were very close to being finished, and we, it was basically giving people what essentially became the demo, and people played it, and they, and it was in Boston, and we were sort of behind these glass windows, all these sort of Boston guys, and like, ah, oh, this is a wicked piece of shit. You know, they, they hated it, and they were making fun of it, and they were saying, you know, it's like, it's like watching some guys from Guys and Dolls getting, you know, beating each other up, and it's the stupidest thing they've ever seen. And we thought we were in pretty good shape at that point. And I remember the focus test guy was like sort of, sort of like a doctor giving me the bad news. You right. know, sorry, Ken, you better get your fares in order. Right. And, um, we, went, we all came into work the next day, and we were like, what are we gonna do? And we're all pretty depressed, but um, I think we started talking, and as we talked, we started thinking about what are they saying to us? What are these people saying to us? What, we think there's something there. Well, how are they missing it? And we decided that there was, maybe they didn't understand who they were and who their role in the, as a character, who their role in the world was, because the game at that point started with you in the ocean, right. floating in the ocean after the plane crash. And the crash still had, was in the fiction, it just wouldn't it, show. You just didn't yeah. see it. So you yeah. didn't have the voiceover saying, my parents always said I was going to do great things or whatever that. They didn't show the plane crash. We didn't establish a time period. Because, yeah. you know, the plane is critical to establishing you're smoking a cigarette. It's very 1960s looking. Um, the, all that stuff was established. It wasn't established. So we decided we had no time and no money and no... So we sort of came up with a script. We, you know, we, I wrote some lines, a line, I think, Nate, one of our artists, recorded the line. Steven and Sean and those guys got to work on building this very simple sequence, which was the, well, simple, um, straight, relatively simple um, yeah. sequence. And then the plane crash actually happens over the, a, the, di the uh, Bioshock logo we already had. Yeah. But I sort of wrote, we wrote a radio play behind that with, uh -huh. you know, altitude, altitude, the crash. And that, I think, set the emotional, and the people screaming in terror on the plane crash, that set the emotional tenor much better and explained who the player was. And all of a sudden, we released, then I think the next real encounter we had was people playing the demo, yeah. public encounter, and all of a sudden it was a very different experience. No, I, I remember even back in the day, we did, I think we did a thing on TV where you kind of talked about it, and it was like that night, and I remember that night, like people on the forums were just like going nuts. And even though the game had, I think, had a lot of press attention, when people finally got to play it and go through that sequence, yeah, I just remember there was this mass sort of excitement around it, and then the game shipped only 
what, a few weeks after that, right? Or a month after or a, that? Oh, a, few, a week later, or a few days later. It's amazing, know. like, now to, to hear that, like, literally, like, a month before the game came out, like, the plane sequence came online or something. I mean, it was that late, right? <laughs> then, uh, Yeah, well, we saw to go through certification and all yeah, that. Yeah, so but it, it's yeah. like within, you it, wasn't, know. it wasn't far. It, was, no. it wasn't far. It was really last minute. And it was one of those things where, like, you really shouldn't be putting in content that yeah. late. Yeah. But, but we felt that we were so close to having something good that we just rolled the dice on it. And um, we worked really hard on it. Like, yeah. it, we had, we worked really hard. I remember how much time I spent on just that recorded of altitude. Altitude, I can still hear yeah. the different version of that in my head. We spent so much time on that stuff. And these guys were working on and getting the, uh, the, the, the animations right. And the, the scene <clears throat> was shot in engine, but we decided to pre-render it so that we had to do less QA on it. Right. There oh, was really? no, it wasn't going to be some like weird streaming error or crash error. Wow. It was just like, so we're just going to show the video, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, because once you start in the ocean, the, we had this experience of testing a lot with the water effects and how beautiful Stephen's water effects were. People didn't realize they were out of a cutscene cut at that scene, point. Yeah. And so right. they would just sit there and stare. And then, right. then they pick up the controller. Yeah. yeah, and they pick up the controller, and all of a sudden they realize they're controlling thing. But, they, but that, yeah, as Sean said, that part of the plane is not actually interactive. It was done in the engine, but we, we just filmed it. Now, as you, people were playing through the game and you were testing it, I'm sure, there was debate about, you know, when would you introduce this plasmids, or what would the ramp be? Did that change at all, sort of as you got towards the end of development about like, oh, we're gonna give people the gun at this point, or it's like, we're gonna trigger these plasmids at this point? Like, how did that work? So like, we moved guns around, like, A, for instance, there was a big debate about, originally you found a gun in the lighthouse, a pistol in the lighthouse. Oh, the right there, yeah. And, because it's a shooter, right? Like, what the hell? And we had a lot of debates about it, and I feel that, it was important that we didn't do that because the fact that you sort of go through a lot of the experience without being having the distraction of a gun is important to getting you immersed in the world because you know when you when you have a uh, all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail right but you don't have the hammer so you just sort of had to take in the world and have that feeling of fear and um, like I know when you saw that splicer bounding around on the ceiling that you couldn't do anything about it and that had, had even though that splicer, those are those moments right like I remember yes. in my Played Unreal for the first time, where it's like you're you're trapped and there's a monster and you can't do it and the lights go out. It's like th that's the moment with the splicer where you're like, I want to do something but I can't, I can't and that yep. evokes an emotion. I remember we kept, you know, moving machine where the machine gun appeared yeah. around and where various plasmids appeared around. It was a real. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a real fine-tuning process. Yeah, and it gave us an opportunity, like especially with the shotgun, to to really present the weapons, like put some space between right. them. It's I a think, moment when you finally. Yeah, I think yeah, like we get Paul, the shotgun Paul sequence. Paul Helquist was yeah. yeah, he put the sequence together for the um, when you see the shotgun laying in the pool of light. Like every every game developer knows what that means. You know, you know the minute you pick that thing up, something's going to happen. But. It was still a very effective way, as I'm remembering it, to, oh, look, I've been waiting for this thing, I'm going to pick it up, and now you have an immediate opportunity to use it. But, you know, at the same time, we're trying to ramp up the tension level by having the splicers kind of on the outside of, of the light, so you can't really see them, and then coming in one at a time and attacking you. Yeah. And we had very little, actually very few tools to really control how they, the splicers acted, so how they were set up and how the environment was lit was really important. You know, those well, there's are, even other things, like when you get the TK plasmid, I don't think we had a lot of physical space and opportunity and time to really present that. So we came up with the narrative that, you know, it was the doctor's office and he used TK to practice tennis. And we had the turret in there that threw tennis balls at you. So if you wanted to, you could catch the tennis balls and throw them and you can knock things down. I think it revealed uh, pickups that you could then, you know, pull to yourself with TK. But we we're always trying to think of like little backstories that we could do. It doesn't have to be as involved as, as the shotgun ambush. Sometimes it's just, oh, let's take a grenade turret and turn it into a tennis ball because, turret. Because we want to, <laughs> yeah, like, and because I, I remember like the impulse was, you know, I've been to dentist office and there's always some like weird aspect of the, the dentist personality. They always want to get through their office, you know, yeah. they just have to have their hobby right, featured right. in some way. And so we saw an opportunity there to both feature this, he's a tennis nut and teach TK at the same time. And the dog. Maybe. 